My name is Judy Mark. I am the president of Disability Voices United. We are an organization directed by and for people with disabilities and their families and um, have been in, uh, in existence for a little less than four years and are really trying to make a big impact here in California. Uh, today's subject is about uh, supported decision making. And we have been quite active in the field of supported decision making for a couple of years now, including uh, leading a project to see how to talk to parents about conservatorship and supported decision making in ways that are, are useful and helpful. Um, we are also um, leading a project that you're going to hear about from our co-directors called the Supported Decision Making California Advocacy Project, where we're trying to increase the use of supported decision making and as, the, as, as a preference over conservatorship in the state. So today you have some incredible speakers um, and you're, gonna, you're in for a treat to hear from all of them. Um, the final thing that I just want to say is that you know, we do a lot of different work at, at, at Disability Voices United. I hope that you'll join, um, actually by coming here, you have joined our mailing list because you registered for this event. But I hope you get involved in the work that we do. We've been very active in trying to advocate for vaccines for people with disabilities. Um, we advocate to implement the self-determination program. Um, and we're also involved in communication access as well as well as many other things. This year, we're really hoping to build a disability rights movement in the state. And so we hope that you'll join us in our work and, um, and look forward to meeting all of you at some point when we actually get to meet in person. Oh, the final thing I wanted to say is that we are having a big conference on April 16th through 18th on the self-determination program, which goes statewide for people with developmental disabilities in California, starting in, in June, July. And um, our conference is going to be virtual, of course, but it's gonna be um, half days, April 16th through 18th on a very unique platform called Socio. Um, I'm gonna ask Ed to put in the chat ways for you to join our mailing list, or, and, and to get information about our, um, our conference and to register for it. So I hope that uh, you have a really terrific uh, uh, forum today and I look forward to hearing all of your questions and all your presentations. Thanks everybody. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Darlene Hansen who is your moderator for the day. Good morning. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, we're very excited to stand tonight. Um, I wanna, First of all, I'll say my thanks to all the speakers who agreed to uh, present all their information and share um, the basics and the backgrounds on supported decision making. I think it's new to many, probably of the people on in the audience here, and so this will be a great um, getting started uh, platform for you. I also want to thank Ability Central Philanthropy. Philanthropy. I'm a speech language person, and I can't say my words and the WIF Foundation for the grants that uh, allowed us to put together this project and the board and for sure the uh, SDM California Advisory Project Team within DVU that's really been working on this for the year. That's, we are wrapping up our grant right now. So um, thank you all for all the participation. We had an advisory committee that worked with us on this and I, they were awesome. So it's been a big project. Um, another thing I want to share, Judy kind of mentioned we have a communication disabilities access network. And we do have a survey that we're asking people to complete. And at some point later in the session here, Ed will be putting through the chat the link to that survey. And again, if you're on our email list, you should be getting that information. Um, there's an incentive uh, by March 8th, if you complete it, we have a little bit of a um, drawing event going on. But please fill that out because it'll help the other grant that we're working on um, gather more information about people's needs in, in terms of communication. Um, so that's going to come through the thread. Um, a couple ideas I wanted to just kind of set the stage for uh, as we get started. We wanted to acknowledge that some people in this audience are, have probably already conserved their persons um, and or are living with under a conservatorship. conservatorship and we get that, that's, that's, we, that's our reality, okay? Um, and so the information you're gonna hear today is really new information that you can apply to how that fits in your world, whether it be um, 
using supported decision making, even though you're under a conservatorship or exiting it, which is a whole different story. But we're not. It, it, we understand people are conserved, so that's that's the way it is. So we wanted to kind of remind you all that we already know that that that's this information is is under it's understood. We also wanted you to understand that we um, in California. Um, we call it conservatorship. In other places, other states, they call it guardianship. So if you at any time hear guardianship and wonder if that's different than conservatorship, it's the same. It's just they call it something different in other places. So in California, it's conservatorship. And then I don't know, I hope Ed's ready. I wanted to share with you all, um, the last thing is uh, Disability Voice United has a parent-to-parent -parent handbook on supported decision making. And it's on our website. And if Ed, I, Ed, can you try? For the moment, I'm in the process of sharing screen so that you can Perfect. witness it. I am just having no worries. a little bit of trouble because I was. You're busy. Doing other stuff. Okay. One second, everybody. So this handbook is available online. And um, I'm going to show you just what's in the table of contents and encourage you to go online to our website, disabilitiesvoicesunited.org. And this is, how, it out. this is how you can find it. You'll go to issues, you'll go to supported decision making. Our website is cooperating today, which is very nice. Sometimes it takes a minute for it to load. You're going to scroll down. One moment. So you're going to scroll down, allow me to, there's so many different things on my screen. <laughs> there we go. To the, click the link below to view our handbook, which is under the heading, uh, the supported decision-making handbook for parents. You're gonna click on it and it will take you directly to this page, uh, this lovely image of the cover page. So here's our table of contents which of course I can't read because it's so very small on my screen. Um, anyway, you can see that we've got information about how to get started, what is supported decision-making, um, how does it apply in all the different arenas? So finance, employment, um, community, education, healthcare. There's little tips in, throughout the uh, handbook. It's not so long and overwhelming that it would be cumbersome. It's, it's really very useful. So it's written for parents, but again, the information, just apply it to whatever age frame you're talking and thinking about, because um, except for the education piece, it doesn't really change. All right, so that's something, the last resource I wanted to share with y'all. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Suzanne so that we can get started. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Suzanne Bennett Francisco. I am the co-director with Darlene for the uh, SDM CAP Supported Decision-Making California Advocacy Project. And I'm also a parent of three young adult uh, children with differences and who are cunning. And uh, my oldest daughter, Kylie, uh, is 21 and she'll be joining us today and sharing uh, what it's like for her and her supporters with her AAC device. So this is her first presentation, it's very exciting. Um, and I wanted to share with you who the speakers are today. So first we have Tim Jin. He's a self-advocate and AAC user and board member for Ability Central Philanthropy and also for Disability Voices United. Um, and we have Judge Doherty, who is a retired justice instrumental in Nevada's uh, 2019 supported decision-making guardianship reform laws. And it's a treat to have her and I, I can't wait to hear from, from each of these speakers. Um, we also have Clarissa, Dr. Clarissa Kripke from the University of uh, San Francisco Office of Developmental Primary Care and a Communication First board member. Um, and she knows so much about uh, supported healthcare decision-making. So we're very happy to have her. And then Dr. Amy Handready, who's a professor of special education at California State University Northridge and a Chime Institute Leadership Award winner for quality educational programs for students with significant support needs. Um, and then we also have um, Anne Bui, Manager of Housing Services at the Kelsey and Disability Voices United board member, and um, myself, 
and my daughter Kylie, which I'm very excited to, to join you all. And I would just say, you know, that was a small introduction for all of these people. These um, speakers and presenters are just um, incredible professionals and uh, expertise in this area. And I can't wait to hear from each of them. So thanks to all our presenters. And um, Tim Jin is gonna share with us first, who is always an amazing speaker. Um, so Tim, uh, if you're available, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. Um, I also wanted to let people know that um, some people were having a hard time getting in here and we're waiting in the waiting room. So I just wanna make sure that there's, there's nobody there now. And Tim, I think you're muted. Are we able to unmute Tim? Yes, I've asked Tim to unmute on my end. Okay. We can hear you, Tim. There we go. Great. Take it away, Tim. Thanks so much. Also a board member of Communications First. Good morning, everyone. It's a bit weird to speak to you on a Saturday morning because I much rather prefer sleeping in or better yet, watching cartoons with a bowl of my favorite cereal. Do they even have morning cartoons anymore? Does anyone remember DuckTales or Popeye? Geez, I'm really showing my age right now. If anyone is saying that they remembered watching G.I. Joes, then we are the same age, a real American hero. I would like to thank Darlene and Suzanne and the entire Disability United Voices team for bringing us all together for these sessions of supported decision making. Judy, I, and many of our board members are always in the spotlight, advocating for our cluster of communities, but without having an excellent staff that are always turning the butter, our voices would be diluted with everyone else. Thank you everyone for your constant upkeep and your support at managing all of us and adjusting to our personalities. <laughs> As some of you know, we are a very outspoken board of directors with multiple projects going on all the time. Thank you for your consistency. Okay, now that is over, the spotlight is on me again. Nina and Ed, I just contributed to your end of the year holiday bonus. <laughs> I'm joking because everyone here knows that I don't enjoy being the center of attention. I would like to give you a very quick overview of my AAC needs and how I always make sure to get my voice heard in a medical setting, like at doctor's appointments. It will take me too long to go through all of the communication devices that I've had in the past. Not to go into great detail of my communication needs, but I first learned how to type with my tones on a manual typewriter when I was in elementary school. After that, I have had numerous devices that I've used to communicate. As my vocabulary grew and my needs changed, my devices almost always adapted with me. You wouldn't let your child wear the same pair of shoes as they grow out of them. Why would I be using the same manual typewriter to spell out my name when I could carry on a full conversation with my parents when they asked me of what I learned from school that day? To sum it all up. I've had AAC devices just as small as a BlackBerry up to a 10 pound laptop, just like Stephen Hawking had at the time and all different devices and sizes in between. I apologize for being so vague, but take a look at your closet and see how many pairs of shoes you have. It will be nearly impossible to remember all of them. This is how I am with my devices. I've had many, 
too many for me to name them all in this session. Most of them are so old that you can't even find them when you search for them on Google. This is how old I have become. <laughs> I don't use supported decision making. My parents never thought about conserving me. They have always questioned who I'm currently dating at the time, and I need better decision making in that portion of my life, but I've always liked having variety. In some ways, this is not a joke within my family circle, but I'm laughing with you now. My doctors always know that I communicate through an AAC device. They are fully aware that I am capable of communicating with them in person, email, or on the phone through TTY relay. They understand that I only have cerebral palsy, and many of my doctors have gotten to know me so well that we have become friends outside of their offices. There are times when their staff reminds them that they have other patients waiting, but regardless who is waiting in the next room, my doctors have always given me as much time that I needed to let them know what is going on and why I am seeing them. Before I go to my appointment, I always type out what is bothering me and print it out and hand it to my doctors so that they will know why I am seeing them. Also, they keep a copy in my file for their records to make sure that I'm getting the proper medication and not coming back with the same illness every time. My doctor wishes that all of their patients would do this because there wouldn't be any communication barriers at properly diagnosing someone. When I need to get a referral, my doctor always lets their colleagues know that I am fully capable of understanding and conversing with them and they need to give me time. This is a huge benefit for all. Whenever I am seeing a new doctor, there is always misunderstanding on how to communicate with me no matter how much my primary care physician instructs their office. There is always a communication barrier no matter how much forethought we do prior to the first visit. There are times where I get dismissed and mistreated. There is another topic that I would like to address and this should be a concern to everyone that uses AAC and have to use supported decision making. Maybe Darlene and Suzanne can relate to this problem. Many new users that aren't familiar with their device might feel uncomfortable expressing their thoughts because they might not be exposed to other AAC users. They often feel timid and hesitated to speak their minds because of the lack of encouragement from their family and friends. This leads their devices not being used and they are not being efficient at communicating for their needs. This causes even more barriers at decision making. As a person that uses a speech generating device to speak their thoughts, I'm more concerned about this matter than anything else that this group has presented in the past sessions and breakout rooms. The topic has always been how to teach professionals, such as doctors, teachers, law enforcement and our regional centers that the individuals are capable of making their own choices. But, you haven't really talked about how a nonverbal person is using their device to speak with their new voice. It's not a secret in the AAC group, once they leave school. A child is less likely to use their device because of the lack of training and encouragement. During the pandemic, studies have shown that AAC usage has fallen dramatically because there are no in-person classes and many households aren't making their child communicate through their device. I beg all of you that are in this situation to stop because you are not benefiting your child and young adult because in the real world, 
despite how much advocacy we do on supported decision making, there are very few people willing to stop and listen to them unless they have some way of communicating, either through low tech or high tech. For those people who see a letter board or an iPad to be cumbersome and much rather guess what they are saying, because you are family, let me say something with my natural voice and see if Darlene and Suzanne can understand me. Give me one second and let me clear my throat. If you couldn't understand me, I just said that I want to have pizza for dinner. I hope you all understand what I'm trying to say. That decision making needs to be inherited along with AAC to get their points across. Thank you. I'm going back to eating my breakfast and watching some cartoons. Tim, that was awesome. Suzanne, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yep. Hi, thank you so much, Tim. Thanks for sharing. Um, we're really excited to also have Judge Doherty share next. And again, she is a retired justice from Nevada who was very instrumental in getting the supported decision-making law passed there and um, had a very um, specific plan in order to do that. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from Judge Doherty. Thank you so much. Good morning. Um, good morning. I am working on my screen. Um, but Suzanne, can you tell me what you see? I see supported decision making Doherty, a PowerPoint in your file folder, but it's not open. Okay. Okay, Darlene, will you just pull up yours then? Okay, I'll do that right now. And let me stop jumping around here. Let me share my screen. Whoops, hang on. Uh, share screen. Can you all see that? Yep. Okay. And that's the last, that's the last uh, yep. page. I'll get it to the top. There we go. And that's the second to the first page. That's weird. I said go to the beginning. Okay. It won't go. Forward. That's the last. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, thank you so much, Suzanne and Darlene and the um, Disability United Voices. Tim, I found your presentation so compelling. Um, and I found your statement so accurate um, that once children leave school, at the age of adulthood and go into the community, they are dismissed more often than not, even though they had previously worked with individuals who could recognize and would recognize and validate their decision-making. It is much more challenging once a young um, teenager becomes an adult and supported decision-making is only one tool, only one tool in an array of, of supports that uh, family or friends or an individual may use to ensure that their voices are heard. Um, so Tim, thanks again for sharing uh, very realistically uh, the challenge and the goal and the success that you clearly have exhibited in, in continuing to use your voice to convey your uh, uh, decisions. So my first slide was uh, entitled uh, Supported Decision-Making, um, a, a United Journey. And that is because supported decision-making as one tool to advance the independence of an individual <clears throat> um, or an individual in a family uh, to ensure that that person's voice is heard. But what is that journey and why is it so important and why would we take it? And the reason I have the Camino de Santiago in the screen on the second um, page is that that currently is my decision-making process. I am deciding, should I take this incredible journey in Spain 
uh, 500 miles um, when my family and friends were quite skeptical of both my abilities and likelihood of success. And the challenge and the point is that we all have journeys to complete. And only by challenging ourselves and those around us can we really determine the expansive scope of our existence as we travel to the best life that we can accomplish. So on screen three, we ask ourselves, what is the journey? What are we talking about when we're talking about supported decision-making or reaching our ultimate goal of independence? And we're really talking about four things. We're reaching for our own self-reliance, whether it is the person supported and that person's desire to control and decide critical and not so critical matters in their lives. We are reaching for the self-reliance of our family members or ourselves when we identify supported decision-making or other alternatives to independence. And why is that so important? Why is creating an alternative mechanism to conservatorship um, so important. And it's because making and achieving our independence, making and achieving our personal goals through our decision decisions are really allowing us to develop our potential and live our best life. And I am so convinced that we are each here and each are entitled on an equal level to achieve our best existence and our best life and certainly self-control and self-decision-making is a huge component of that. But how do we do that? How do we do that when we perhaps, our 64-year-old woman who's never walked more than uh, 10 miles looking to accomplish a 500-mile journey? And the answer is we do that with the support of our companions, with the support of our family, with the support of our friends who know us with the support of our teachers and our medical providers who know us. We all proceed in our lives with the support of others. So when we talk about supported decision-making, we're really just focusing on a term for a practice and a pattern that has occurred in all of our lives and that has occurred with persons who have special challenges in, the, in their lives for decades and hundreds of years through the support of their family and friends, through the support of their walking companions. And supported decision-making is now a phrase that we've attached to something that really has existed for so long. You know, when I used to go out and talk more often on supported decision-making after my presentations, people would come up and say, well, we did that for my Aunt Sarah, or we did that for my cousin Jeff but we never had a document. And that's because we have, and we do provide the support that our loved ones need to develop their independence to their maximum abilities. This is just a new way to have those practices recognized. And on slide number four, we kind of ask, well, why, why would we take this journey? And, if it were me uh, on my own little journey, I think I can accomplish that journey. If it is you in your journey to independence, or if it is you in your familial capacity to someone you want to see maximize their independence, you believe in that person. You believe that we have the ability, that the person you love has the ability, regardless of how they are viewed through other people's lenses. And we want to ensure as human beings that what we do matter, what we, what we engage in matters. And for persons who have uh, personal challenges or disabilities or physical impairments or aged, uh, aged challenges, what we all do still matters. And we can never move in directions that invalidate the importance and relevance of each of us in our journeys in life. Supported decision-making, formal, informal, legally recognized, not legally recognized, is a way to kind of support that person who has decided to maximize their independence and in their decision-making. And it makes all of us feel part of a tribe, right? Part of our family, in some cases, part of a friendship group, 
in other cases, part of a circle of support. But we are engaging in this path for independence of an equal nature. And we do it because we live in a tribe and in a family and in a circle that wants to ensure that we all achieve our, our maximum independence. So let me go to the next slide. Well, we often had the question, um, I'll tell you a little bit about our journey after a couple of more explanations, but we often had the question when we were first starting to talk about supported decision-making in the state of Nevada, well, where do you start? Where do you just start with supported decision-making? You know, how do you know how to do it? Um, and in my view, you start with each person developing their decision-making skills at the earliest age possible. Uh, one area of concern that we used to have until we negotiated with our school district was that IEPs weren't including the fundamental skill of electing a choice in IEPs for persons who may not simply have that skill developed, but has the capacity if focus was given to making a choice between one or the other. And so in our school district, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it, in our school district in Washoe County, they agreed to include decision-making skills in the earliest IEPs, but no later than fifth grade, um, to ensure that each person has the ability and the support to develop their decision-making skills. And we practice, we practice our skills with others. When we're young, when we're in uh, early years and in middle school and in high school, we want to ensure that our young adults and our young students are able to practice decision making. And to do that, they really learn and are supported in learning what choices are. Does an individual have the ability to understand choices? And in really only the most seriously disabled cases, our choices not something that can be communicated and conveyed. Well, I'm not a medical person. Certainly we have observed and researched and witnessed decision-making choices by persons who would otherwise, as Tim had said, have been dismissed or disregarded based on a quick impression of that individual's capacity. We know that most persons are able to indicate some basic preferences if given the ability to develop the method of communication by which they, they um, convey that. And another area in supported decision-making that really has to exist, we have to have trusted supporters and trusted mentors. And those mentors are obviously the primary person to raise the child, that child, you or me, or um, parents and teachers and, and persons who really su support us for me and my family, support us as we develop our skills. And with that support, we develop both a trusting relationship with other people, understanding that we can communicate and convey our choices. And we develop confidence on our, in our own abilities based on the conveyance of trust and confidence that we receive from other people um, who we really believe uh, have our best interests at heart. So on um, six, on number six, I think we tell you a little bit about the basics of supported decision making as we have viewed it. Um, it in, in kind of my experience in supported decision making, I'm really quite adamant, as I've suggested, that supported decision making is not a written document. Supported decision making is not a legal definition. Supported decision making is a pattern of practices either written down or not written down, that support an individual uniquely to that individual at, to allow that individual to exercise decisions regarding that person's life goals, desires, and objectives. In other words, it is a united, trusting environment in which a person who may need additional support feels comfortable enough to exercise his or her choices in a way that furthers his or her uh, life goals and, and preferences. So this is only one little sentence on really the thing that started the whole legal protocol or the whole formal protocol 
of supported decision making become an international, an international practice and priority for persons who are disabled. The United Nations in 2006 passed the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Many of you have probably heard of it, know about it. Many of you certainly are familiar with what I'm talking about today in general. But the convention changed everything because the convention engaged over 200 countries in a commitment that their governments would ensure that persons with disabilities were provided with appropriate support to allow them to be directly involved in decisions that impact their lives. And from my point of view as a lawyer, from my point of view as a judge, and from my point of view as a mother and a person who cares um, deeply about these issues, we would not be where we are today advancing the independence of persons with disabilities or in need of support without this 2006 um, uh, convention. If any of you are interested in reading more about the UN convention, I quite find frankly find it quite fascinating and exciting. The specific language is in section 12. The United States has not um, confirmed the, the, the treaty. It was the first civil rights, human rights treaty of this new century. Um, the United States uh, passed it, but did not ratify it, which means that they will not agree to be bound by the terms and conditions of the convention, which also means they will not open uh, the country's practices that the government establishes for review by the United Nations, um, which is one of the protocols. Regardless, we know that in Australia, in England, in Ireland, in China, in um, countries throughout the world, the amount of energy and emphasis and commitment and dedication that has gone into implementing supported decision-making and methods to support the independence of individuals with disabilities uh, as an alternative to guardianship has been substantial, has been really earth-shaking. And so when we discuss it, realize that we are steep in the discussion on an international basis that has nowhere to go but up. The progression is substantial and inevitably uh, it will change the face of probate court, guardianships and conservatorships uh, in the years to come as we all adjust to this new perspective. Um, and on the next slide. And Judge Doherty, I'm, um, we have about three minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank Next you. slide, I'll just tell you why I personally became a little bit uh, more engaged with this area than um, I had been. In 2012, I was given the guardianship caseload in Nevada, in Washoe County, and we decided to see who we represented, who was in our caseload, and what we found out was astounding. We found out that the same number of persons entering the guardianship conservatorship system at 18 to 29 that number was the same percentage as persons entering the system between 60 and 100. And so we were filling our system at both ends of the age spectrum in a way that really concerned me because we did not want our young people in that guardianship system all of those years. And we also found out that it was the school district making those referrals. I'll take the next slide. We can read those uh, later. So I'm gonna skip this slide. This is just kind of a definition. So we passed in Nevada in 2019 after doing a massive statewide um, kind of road tour of supported decision-making and why we needed to consider it as an alternative. We ultimately did pass a, a law that recognizes supported decision-making and sets up the protocols as to what a valid supported decision-making document should look like, although it left open the ability for a document to have other protocols. And so for the first time, third parties now in Nevada must recognize a supported decision-making agreement, the same as a power of attorney, or the same as a living trust, or the same as other legal documents um, that are signed to allow persons to support someone else in making their decisions. I'll take the next slide. 
So I don't know if Jonathan's, Jonathan is on the phone, but Jonathan Martinez is the national voice uh, for supported decision making, in my opinion. And he has led the way in ensuring that we know that supported decision making not only is just kind of this document or protocol, but it is a philosophy and, and uh, process which can be built into your existing documents. If you look at the second paragraph, um, Jonathan has dictated language that we can put in powers of attorney, guardianships, trust, to incorporate the priority that an individual wants to retain as much control over life, over their life decisions. And if I am an appointing an agent to make decisions for me, it is only after that agent has conferred and made sure that I choose not to or am not able to make those decisions. So take a look at that. This can be incorporated into all sorts of documents, IEPs, trust, uh, case plan, service agreements. Um, so with or without the existence of supported decision-making being recognized in your state right now, put the language in existing documents that are recognized in your state right now and start everyone getting used to the idea that supported decision-making is a priority before agent decision-making is triggered. I'll take the next slide. So this is kind of a concept that we want you to appreciate. This is actually from the Nevada Supreme Court. Um, and, and we really have a continuum of choices and I hope they expand even more of how we support ourselves or our loved one to make decisions that are healthy and appropriate, but not even appropriate, to make decisions that further one's desires and preferences in life. And on the informal side of the California scope, you know, we just have no agreement. As, as Tim said, he's never had a supported decision-making agreement. It's his preference and it's his success that he has advanced his independence without the need of writing down anything, but with his passion and support, uh, he has achieved his goals in his life. But the informal are, are family, friends, case managers, good neighbors, grocers, employers who all support um, individuals who may need little accommodation or um, an environment that is conducive to that person advancing their preferences or choices. Right now, supported decision-making in California is not a, a court, legal, or statutory protocol, but it can exist because it should exist. The only challenge in supported decision-making, even if you write it down in California, is you, the advantage is you all understand what the goals are, you all understand what the support is going to be, you all understand that the individual um, we'll be making your own decisions. You just provide, provide the support. Um, in California, you know, third parties don't really have to recognize that. Hopefully they will, which is why Jonathan Martinez suggests that we also put those documents and that language in a power of attorney, which is recognized by third parties. So we go from independent all the way to conservatorship and we want that conservatorship to be as minimal as possible. And we know that there are individuals who have them now and that's understandable and appropriate. But there's also pathways to reduce the oversight, reduce the conservatorship, and move toward the other direction of uh, supports in the life of an individual should they have that preference. I'll take the next slide. So this is my little graph of trying to show what we are all trying to accomplish here. And the supported adult has lots of arenas of support, right? That person might reach support through a grocery store, a hardware store, a gym, any individuals in the community who support that person because they've come to know them and know their preferences. And we know that our family and friends are really our village. And we are all seeking to have the supported person really achieve the most enviable, enviable life possible, which is all of our right. The missing piece, the, the little puzzle piece is, how do we get that final circle, those third parties to recognize supported decision-making or the ability of an individual to achieve uh, decision-making preferences with um, unconventional protocol. And that's really what we're working on and what I imagine California will continue to work on as we move forward. And I'll take the next slide. So here's some resources. I did want to tell you that I thought your California website, California Courts was fabulous. And it includes in there very specifically that conservatorships should only be the last resort and that alternatives exist from informal, which is what we've been talking about, to, to more formal like powers of attorneys and living trusts. 
And I found it so encouraging that that was the California court website. And finally, under the probate code that you have just in the review that I did of it, um, there is certainly protocol to petition the court to either terminate the conservatorship, modify the conservatorship, reduce the authorities of the conservatorship, and really perhaps in certain individuals' lives, that may be merited. We closed a lot of cases in Nevada, both before the law was passed and after the law was passed, for individuals who brought their supporters into court and said, this is our plan, this is how we're going to do it. And we treated those hearings as joyous occasions, pictures would be taken, guardianships and conservatorships would be terminated, and they would go forth. Would they come back? A few. That isn't a failure. That's just a, a reconnection with some supports that maybe didn't exist as they thought, but we're always moving forward in the line of, of independence for all, regardless of our circumstances um, and, and health. So that's my little uh, sharing of information from Nevada. There's much, much more, but you are well on your way in California, so I have no worries with respect to your accomplishing your goals. Thank you so much, Judge Doherty. Uh, it's, it's such a value to have you here. And I know everybody really appreciates your expertise in this area. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, and uh, I could listen to you for another hour, actually. <laughs> Can we have another 15 minutes? <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we, we also have Dr. Amy Hanready um, that's gonna share with us. She's a professor of special education at uh, University of California. I, I believe I believe Clarissa is next. Oh, okay. Well, I was just really excited to have Dr. Amy Han ready. So um, <laughs> we have Dr. Thank you. We have Dr. Clarissa Kripke from UCSF um, from the Office of Developmental Primary Care, and she is an authority in supported healthcare decision making, and she's also on the board of Communication First and has just a wealth of experience in supported decision-making. So we're so happy to have you here, Dr. Kripke. Thank you so much. So um, I'm not going to do the PowerPoint thing today. I have my website up uh, there for you to see, and there's a wealth of information on our website about supported decision-making and a lot of tools for helping you to implement healthy lifestyles and, and supported decision-making in a healthcare context. Um, I am a primary care physician and my patient population includes uh, people, transition age youth and adults, uh, everywhere from teenagers who are still in the school system. And I have patients in my population with significant disabilities who are in their 90s uh, and who have no parental support at all or family support at all. Uh, and so we can make this work for everybody. And I can say that with authority because we have been working on working through a supported decision-making paradigm uh, or, or process for 15 years now. And California has a Lanterman Act, which enables us to do that even for people with the most significant challenges, even for people with very limited communication or even people whose expressive communication can't be interpreted uh, at all. And I do have patients who uh, who don't even make facial expressions in response to, to questions or, or their environment. And so, and, and yet we make this work for everybody. And let me talk a little bit about, about what that means and how we do it. So, um, so what supported decision-making means is that people retain their legal capacity. That means their right to make their decisions in their own lives, to enter into contracts to the best of their ability, uh, even when sometimes or most of the time they don't have the mental capacity um, or they need support in order to make those decisions. So, uh, so in order to, we need to assess mental capacity, not not to label someone as someone lacking mental capacity, but to assess that for each decision at each moment in time. So, um, so just because you struggle with one type of decision and it's really unclear whether you understand your options, whether you've weighed your options against each other, whether you understand the risks and benefits of each option, and whether you're able to communicate a choice, 
Um, sometimes, sometimes people get tripped up in one of those steps, but can participate in others of those steps. To make a real informed medical decision, you need to be able to do all of those steps. But again, just because uh, someone is unable to make a very complex decision that's very abstract, like, uh, like should I take one kind of uh, one kind of surgery versus taking uh, another kind of medication for the same problems or um, uh, for the same type of problem that might be a very complex decision that uh, under that requires you to understand probabilities, um, or it could be a very simple decision like I know when I take my Tylenol, my headache goes away. I want that Tylenol. Um, those are two different, very different types of of decisions that um, that people can make. And just because you struggle with one doesn't mean you can make the other. Um, so retaining your legal capacity gives you the ability to make the decision about the Tylenol, even if you need support or even if you need substituted decision for the more complex uh, decision-making or because you're not feeling well and aren't able to, to um, participate uh, in, the, in the same way at that time. So, um, so when we have patients or, or people who um, have significant disabilities that impact their ability, their receptive language uh, and, and their ability to understand their choices or their ability to think about them or to communicate about them, then, um, then uh, this, this concept of supported decision-making is still important because number one, it means that we still need to try each and every time. Just because we didn't succeed the first time doesn't mean we don't try the second time. It doesn't mean we don't try for future decisions. Um, it means that people with disabilities need to be in the room when decisions about them are being made. And if people don't retain their legal capacity, people start to make decisions uh, behind their back um, and to talk about them behind their back. So they don't even have the ability to hear what people are saying about them uh, and, um, and to make whatever contributions they, they can to the conversation, either through their, uh, their body movements, through their, uh, sometimes people get agitated when certain things are said and it becomes pretty clear that that conversation is upsetting to them. And, and that all, that's all information, even if it isn't a fully informed decision. Um, and uh, and it also means that we are helping people build their skills. When people learn to make decisions by making decisions, and if we never give them the opportunity, they'll never develop those skills. They need the information. They need to be exposed to the settings. They need their confidence built. We need to talk directly to them. Um, and uh, and uh, even people who we anticipate will always uh, require support, need to learn how to manage boundaries with their support, how to manage their support, and how to live an interdependent life, not necessarily an independent life, but an interdependent life. And, um, and that's what supported decision making is too, that even if we anticipate that somebody may need support their whole life, that doesn't mean um, that they don't need skills to be able to be self-determined and, and to make contributions to decisions for themselves and, and to, to make decisions that will, um, that will contribute to their communities and their families. So uh, practically speaking, if you have a transition age person that you're supporting, or if you are transition age, here are some things that you can do. Uh, first of all, it is, I, it is not ideal to reach the age of 18 and develop and, and come into your legal capacity never having made a decision in your life. So we need to teach people how to make decisions. Like I said, you learn to make decisions by making decisions. And we have created a book called What's Next, and it is a self-advocate's guide to uh, transition. And it it's really, the, the audience for it is primarily parents, although uh, people with, it was written by a person with a disability and, and other people uh, can certainly read it, but it guides you through how to develop a 
how, how to parent, how to support uh, the, a, a child to learn how to set those boundaries, how to make decisions in their lives, starting with simple decisions and, and moving to more complex ones. All of us, whether we have a disability or not, will sometimes lack the mental capacity to make a decision. For example, if I'm in a terrible car accident or if I take a strong medication or if I go into surgery, I may not be able to make decisions for myself. And so having a power of attorney uh, gives you the ability to designate who you would want to make decisions if you couldn't make them for yourself. And that is an important document. And even people who might struggle with some kinds of medical decisions often know who they trust to make those decisions for them if they can't make them themselves and who they want to support them. So, um, so often somebody who might struggle to understand some medical details might say, yeah, uh, my mom comes to my medical appointments and, and she makes my, you know, she, she helps me when I can't. Um, so people can execute a valid power of attorney even if they have uh, struggles with making some kinds of choices for themselves. And that is an important document to have in the tool. It's, it's transferring decision-making to a third party in some situations, but if it's part of the tool, then you can feel more confident in using supported decision-making uh, principles and in, in avoiding conservatorship because you know that there's a backup plan in the case where someone lacks the mental capacity at a specific moment in time for a specific decision, um, that that decision can get made in, in some way. You can put this in your individual program plan um, and language like uh, what the judge showed uh, from, from, uh, uh, from Mr. Martinez about um, about language that prioritizes supported decision making before moving to other forms of decision making. Uh, you can put that right into your IPP so everybody's clear about who the players are and how you want things done. You can fill out an advanced directive. The California Coalition for Compassionate Care has a plain language advanced directive form and it has training materials for self-advocates on how to complete their own advanced directive. Advanced directive is just a paper that says what you, who you'd wanna make decisions if you couldn't make them yourself and also gives you an opportunity to put down information about your values and what you would want done at the end of life or even um, uh, after you pass away, uh, what, what kind of burial and what kind of other things are, are your priorities. Um, so that you can help someone complete that kind of document, even if they're young and healthy and, uh, and have uh, no, no medical problems at the time. Um, you can complete forms for, to make people authorized representatives so they can help you with health insurance materials and get access to healthcare information. So people are worried that they won't be able to access healthcare information. You can sign uh, paperwork uh, to allow someone to help you with that um, called uh, an authorized representative uh, paper that would just allow you to, to contact the health insurance company or, or to get medical records and that type of thing. Um, you can create a succession plan if, if the people that, are, that you want to support you now can't do it, what, how do you want that person replaced? Um, and then you can give these documents, your supported decision-making agreements, your powers of attorney, your advanced directives, your IPPs, to everyone who needs them, everyone who's listed in them, regional center personnel, your doctor, other people who might need, need to have that information. Uh, um, in terms Bertha, of- I'm sorry, yeah. we have just about one more minute. Okay. Yeah. Um, we all are excited about this topic and could talk about it forever. Um, so. Uh, so to, to, to sum it up, um, we have a lot of resources on the Office of Developmental Primary Care website to help you with this uh, and information on how to manage meetings in hospital teams, how to prepare for meetings uh, if you're meeting with, with physicians that can help you to feel more empowered. And, um, and we and, and when you're talking to doctors, it's really important to keep them focused on 
The lives of people with disabilities are meaningful and valuable. There's no such thing as too disabled um, to live. There is such thing as too sick to live, uh, but not too disabled to live. And we need to manage the ability bias of people in the health care professions who sometimes uh, miss the mark on those two points. And, um, and if you're feeling pressured to, if you're feeling pressured to make, uh, to prematurely withdraw life-saving care um, or, or to make decisions that don't feel good to you, call in reinforcements. Um, understand that having a supporter there is part of your Americans with Disabilities rights and uh, and you should be able to, um, uh, it, you know, you have a community behind you. So if you're trying to make a decision, you're feeling bullied, then we're here to back you up. And that's um, uh, later, uh, if there's time, we can take a look at the Office of Developmental Primary Care website, but it, uh, the, I point to it, um, the website's right there. Uh, and that has a lot more information. So thank you so much. I'm just thrilled that you're all here and, um, and uh, support everything that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kripke. So invaluable to have you here. Really appreciate it. She has a lot of resources on her website. So she's um, pointing you there for a very good reason. So please do visit and see all the tools that she has there. Um, and next we have Dr. Amy Handready, who's a professor of special education at California State University of Northridge and a Chime Institute Leadership Award winner for quality educational programs for students with the most significant support needs. And Dr. Handready, we're so happy that you can join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I just wanted to uh, thank Disability Voices United for having me. It's, it's definitely a pleasure to be here and to be kind of the, the token educator in this group. Um, I, I'm happy to have this role. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and uh, paste into the chat right now to just a few resources. I'm following the chat and I see people are really eager for uh, as many resources as possible. So uh, that, that's there along with the slides that I'm gonna use, although the slides are really kind of just a, a discussion guide. Um, and I, I also wanna to try to make some connections to some of the previous presenters. So uh, I think that I'm gonna to try to connect to uh, Tim and his emphasis on access to communication uh, throughout, uh, throughout students' lives um, and uh, Judge Doherty uh, and establishing those underlying skills uh, early uh, at the earliest ages to support uh, individuals and in being able to make uh, decisions that impact their lives. And, um, and so I really think that as we're thinking about the education connections to support decision-making, we really need to go back to those earliest uh, stages, uh, the youngest students, and how are we supporting uh, the ability to make decisions uh, at a very young age. Um, and then, I wanted to uh, kind of just point out that from an educational perspective, um, we're really focused on these principles. So I think that when we're talking about supported decision making and self determination, um, this is uh, this is leak language. Uh, this is language that uh, is often referring in, in the state of California to specific programs. Um, but these also really connect very strongly to principles in education. Um, so supported decision making, uh, you know, this is one definition here. I know our presenters have presented a few different ones, um, is referring to the supports and services that help an adult with a disability to make their own decisions with the support of trusted friends, family members, professionals, and others. Um, but in an educational setting, you know, we really are looking at the underlying um, relationship between supported decision making and self determination. And, and so self-determination, you know, again, there's many definitions for self-determination. Uh, you know, I, I pulled some resources from Michael Waymeyer's work uh, here on the right. Um, and he refers to being able to make things happen in a person's life instead of having other things, uh, others do things to or for them. Um, choosing and setting your own goals and then working to reach them. Advocating on your own behalf involved in solving problems and making decisions about your own life. 
uh, and that people who are determined make or cause things to happen in their lives that improve the quality of their lives. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about uh, special education and, um, and the ways in which uh, we don't do this enough in special education. And in fact, there are sometimes, uh, there's a culture in special education of making things uh, quite a bit uh, too special uh, and, uh, and, and really not considering the value of self-determination. So if we could just for a second, I'm, I'm very curious, um, uh, if we just kind of think about people on the, on the call today, if you wanna just put into the chat, uh, when you need to make an important decision, who do you talk to? And I'll call out a few of those, uh, of those responses. Okay, so I see comments. Uh, so spouses are listed, children, uh, trusted friends, sisters, family, partner, supervisors, colleagues, sometimes experts. Wonderful. So too often in, in education, um, we take away the ability of, of students to develop those, uh, those networks that we're talking about here. So, so those, those things that are listed here, your, uh, your team, teachers, uh, spouses, uh, those are people that uh, you didn't just turn 18 and then suddenly have access to, <laughs> to all those people in your life right? Um, it takes a long time. It takes many years to develop relationships with people in order to develop that trust uh, and that network of support that we all uh, rely on. And, uh, and I think that when we talk about supported decision making, we tend to talk about it uh, in late adolescence as students are getting ready to, to leave the school system and, um, and often when they're already being educated primarily in, in segregated or self-contained settings and haven't had adequate access to, uh, to that network or community of supports uh, that they're really going to need long-term in order to, uh, to have the, that uh, community to, to rely on. Um, so, um, so, you know, much of my uh, career has been invested in inclusive education. And I really think that inclusive education is deeply interconnected with self-determination and supported decision-making. And I just wanna explain that for a moment. Um, so we know um, that uh, inclusive educational practices uh, are closely tied to positive long-term outcomes. So students who are included in general education with supports and services in place are more likely to be included in the community, to experience integrated employment, and to experience supported living. Um, I live in Los Angeles, and in the Los Angeles Unified School District, only about 1% of students with intellectual disabilities are currently in, included in general education uh, for 80% or more of the day. Um, so if we're looking at these long-term outcomes associated with self-determination, that is a, a really big problem that we have right now. Um, we also know if you look at the bottom that students who spend the majority of their school years in self-contained classes are significantly more likely to, uh, well, uh, to be conserved, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to be uh, employed in sheltered employment uh, types of situations and to live in congregate living um, group homes or other places with other people uh, with disabilities. And it's not that people with disabilities can't live together, but it, uh, often this is not uh, based on the uh, voice by the person with the disability. Um, and then I just want to talk for a moment about the culture of those special education settings. So I know that uh, we have many people here uh, who have had experience in special education settings in one way or another either as an educator, as a parent, or as an individual with a disability. Um, and I supervise teachers in my role at Cal State Northridge and spend a lot of time in those special education settings as well. Um, some of the common features that we see in self-contained settings include uh, a high emphasis on compliance. 
on, uh, on following directions, on establishing routines and, um, and really emphasizing the importance of students following those routines. Um, we also see uh, it's very common in those self-contained settings that educators uh, are talking about and around students rather than uh, rather than to students or involving students in in conversations that impact them. Uh, often, that is most common in those uh, self-contained settings where individuals have less access to uh, communication supports. So, um, so in order to really support self-determination in education, we really need to go back to uh, access to general education where students can be seen as individuals who have a voice and control over their own lives and where we raise that expectation for their long-term involvement in the community. Um, we need to start increasing students' access to choice and control regardless of where they're educated. Uh, and that is really a very big shift when we're talking about special education uh, as a culture. Um, so we involve students in decisions that impact them. Um, that, you know, we have as one of our principles that students should be engaged in their IEP meetings. Um, but that's just one tiny slice <laughs> of all of the different ways that students need to be impact, uh, involved in decisions um, from uh, from day to day types of decisions to uh, all of the decisions about um, who they're going to interact with, who will be supporting them, um, you know, what what classes and activities they're going to be taking and, and engaging in. Um, those are small decisions that, that really set the stage for being able to participate in some of those larger decisions. Uh, and you can see on the right things that we want to avoid. So one thing that we do tend to do in special education is provide really limited or superficial uh, types of options. Uh, even in the very youngest age, ages, we say, do you want to listen to the frog song or the bone? <laughs> uh, you know, we're, we teach do a lot of uh, asking students to choose between two options that honestly aren't very meaningful. Um, and, and we really need to start working beyond that. Um, we also need to work on ensuring that students have opportunities to lead and direct others. Uh, students with disabilities often have uh, experience things being done to them. Um, even inclusive settings are sometimes, uh, you know, directed often by other people, uh, directed by peers and directed by teachers. Um, and so we, we don't want to teach students to be a passive recipient of, of support, uh, but rather that they have those opportunities to lead and direct. Um, and just some simple examples. Um, I know uh, one teacher who, um, she, when students are engaged in an activity, there's, there's a student in the class who has the job of ringing the bell when it's time for everybody else in the class to finish the activity. Um, that means that everybody's looking to that student. That student suddenly has control <laughs> over the entire class and, and what they're doing at that time. Um, so it's a tiny thing, it's a tiny practice that starts to kind of create this experience that, oh, I can direct others. Uh, even if I have limited communication skills currently, uh, even if I have limited motor skills, uh, regardless of the nature or severity of my disability, um, I'm going to have a way to direct other people. Um, students need to have uh, opportunities to express their preferences. Uh, so I put into the, um, the chat some tools that are preference inventories. There's one that's for, uh, directed towards young children and one that's called the personal preference indicates it's more appropriate for old students or, or adults. And, and it's really based on the idea that everybody expresses preferences and um, everybody uh, has, the, has the right to express uh, their interests and preferences. Again, whether they have limited current communication skills or, uh, or are working on expanding those communication skills further. Um, there's also a resource from uh, Aaron Sheldon who provides kind of a system for using those preferences to prioritize and take action um, based on those. Um, so uh, we also want to make sure that we honor students' right to reject and refuse. Uh, 
again, that focus on compliance as uh, sometimes uh, takes away that opportunity to reject uh, or refuse uh, activities, tasks, uh, and things that are offered to a student. And then as Tim was describing earlier, uh, the primary emphasis throughout education needs to be focused on communication, on connection, and on learning. Um, Often in self-contained settings in particular, we have a, a over-reliance on discrete skills uh, that are less connected to meaningful application. Um, and you know, I think one of the things I hate the most about special education settings is task boxes. <laughs> task, uh, there's these tiny boxes with one skill uh, rather than things that are really connected uh, to, uh, to a more, more meaningful learning. Um, and that doesn't teach students to be, yes, yeah, I'm so sorry. We're, we're uh, if you can wrap up this incredible yes. information, we really appreciate it. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, and then I just wanted to also talk about so the improper use of of most to least prompting. So we have a heavy reliance on um, on controlling students and doing things for them uh, with the expectation that eventually they'll do it for themselves. The problem is that over time, uh, that uh, tends to teach students that they cannot do things for themselves. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, the education principles that are taken right out of that handbook that was uh, shared earlier. And I just wanted to draw attention to the top three there that are focused specifically on the role of educators in um, understanding their role related to uh, conservatorship and supported decision-making. Uh, this is an area where we need a lot of work in education. Uh, this is not considered right now part of our educator training uh, programs. And so we is uh, based only on uh, access to a leader or a professor who's familiar for decision-making. So very few educators right now even understand what the options are, um, and so are, are very likely right now to re recommend a conservatorship because they don't understand the other options. Uh, so I think this is one change we really need to work, work towards and advocate for in our state is to embed uh, emphasis on supported decision-making within our teacher preparation programs. Thank you so much. Dr. Hanreddy, I mean, really, this is a huge area, uh, the primary area where we learn about this information. And um, it's so important that um, I think teachers and educators have the information because often when I'm presenting about supported decision making, the teachers are very excited to have this information and they just have never had it. So thank you so much for all that, that all those wonderful tools. Thank you. And so next we have Anne Bui, the manager of housing services for the Kelsey and a Disability Voices United board member and a supporter and many other things. And we're so happy to have you here and we appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. It's such an honor to be here with everyone. Um, and I'm just grateful to be part of a wonderful panel here. Um, so I'm going to take a moment to kind of share my screen and get my slides loaded up here. Um, and go into present mode. Sorry, just a little delay. Um, not sure why it's not responding. Here we go. Everyone can see my screen? Perfect. Okay. Oops. Not sure why it's reverting back. One second. <laughs> Appreciate everyone's patience while I get the technical issue here responding. There we go. So as um, Suzanne mentioned, I'm very honored to be a part of uh, Disability Voices United. And I am the manager of housing and inclusion services at the Kelsey. Um, for those of you who do not know um, about the Kelsey, um, we are building opportunity through inclusivity by pioneering disability afford housing solutions that open doors to more affordable homes and opportunities for everyone. And so just to honor folks who have visual um, disabilities who are on this call. And so I go by the pronoun she and her, a visual description of me is I have long straight black hair, a warm beige skin tone, wearing um, uh, kind of like a beige sweater. And behind me is a visual background of a deep 
blue purplish night sky filled with stars and the words do everything with kindness handwritten across the upper left side of the screen. And on my opening slide, um, there's a photo of my late mother sitting with my younger brother uh, during a holiday visit, um, both smiling and happy to be in, in, in each other's company. And so I have the privilege to sharing um, our family's journey and examples of how we created a um, supported decision-making model um, early on before it were actually termed um, back in the 80s when Martin um, uh, joined our family and moved from there. So um, I, um, for full disclosure purposes, I did receive permission from my family and um, I'll be a younger brother um, to share our experience and photos with you for the purpose of learning and building solutions to resolve the barriers and issues of conservatorship um, and the importance of self-determination and supported decision-making um, at the request of my family and to protect my younger brother from any further abuse or retaliation from his circumstances. Um, I will be using my younger brother's given Vietnamese family name, um, Lan, uh, which means everything that is good, healing, and peaceful. So as I advance to the next slide. So in this slide, there are three family photos that highlights our journey and experiences from Vietnam as boat refugees to Illinois, Florida, and eventually California. Um, there were 11 children in our family. Um, the three youngest were born and raised in America. And um, I'm number 10 and Lan is um, the youngest at number 11. Our mother was uh, trained as a nurse in Vietnam before the war disrupted her residency and forced my family to flee from the North to the South where she became a self-made businesswoman um, to provide for her children while our father fought in the war. Um, as part of the elite special forces uh, to support and protect the American soldiers who were um, involved in the Vietnam War at the time. And after the fall of Saigon in 1975, my family fled to avoid political and religious persecution. And um, over the next couple of slides, we will journey through my family's um, timeline that highlights key events and barriers that uh, we had to overcome to build and maintain a system of support for Lan and to advocate for self-determination and his supported decision-making um, throughout his life. So from across the states, um, on this slide is a timeline. Key dates I'm gonna focus on is 1980, 1988, 2005, and 2013. Um, 1980 was the year that Martin um, joined our family. Um, unfortunately, during his delivery, he sustained a traumatic brain injury um, during his birth and um, was subsequently diagnosed with cerebral palsy, developmental um, disabilities, and um, sensory processing disorder. And um, it took about eight years to um, battle out in court, and we received a um, medical malpractice settlement that was awarded to the family, and um, a guardianship was established in the um, estate in Illinois. And this is where our family um, got and introduced to the guardianship system, and this is where we had to um, overcome our challenges of not only being new to um, the country, but also language and cultural barriers of understanding and navigating the um, guardianship system as it was stated in Illinois um, and supporting and um, deciding how to best uh, support Martin and make the decisions for him. And um, in 2005, we transitioned to Florida for warmer weather, because if anyone is on um, the Midwest, knowing that sub degree zero weather and wind chill um, in the Midwest is not a very um, desirable um, during at least uh, four, between four to six months out of the year, depending on how um, the climate change affects during the years. Um, so from that, we transitioned to Florida and that's where the guardianship transferred from Illinois to Florida from, and it took a full year to establish those services and the um, guardianship in Florida. And then um, between 2011 and up until 2013, we decided to transition Martin to California because of um, our mother aging and her concerns that if she, as the name um, sole guardian and being supporting Martin, um, since birth, um, if she were to um, not be able to no longer serve as his guardian, what would his supported decision-making and what would his um, self-determination 
um, be like um, because we were raised to believe that Martin has within his own ability, his own voice, even though he is nonverbal, he um, communicates through gestures and he communicates with um, supporting um, through his family and through his caregivers of what his dese um, desires and what he needs and um, what he likes and doesn't like. So he's very vocal um, on that through his gestures and um, through uh, his communication style. And so um, from there, we were surprised um, when we re uh, entered into the conservatorship system in uh, Florida, I mean, excuse me, in California. Um, and over the next slide, we will um, go over the barriers and then challenges that kind of disrupt and unraveled um, the barriers between um, deteriorating the self-determination and the supported decision-making that we had organically created for Martin and his system supports throughout the states and um, supporting it through there. So I really appreciate appreciate uh, Judge uh, Doherty's presentation and I wish that she was on our case in California during this time of transition. So um, the key highlights in this slide um, was between uh, March 2014, where um, the court decided to um, appoint a, a professional um, instead of the family because the uh, reasoning was that my mother was uh, aging, there was a lot of communication and cultural barriers, so they did not uh, want uh, my mom to be a conservator um, of the person or the estate at the time because of uh, miscommunication and different um, beliefs in the way that um, how Martin should uh, be supported um, for his life and how what independence and what um, a meaningful life means to him. And so uh, with that, uh, key issues that arise was that uh, Martin's care has deteriorated even though he had communicated that his um, dental uh, needs were not being met and that uh, he was um, in pain. Um, it was ignored and dismissed. And this is going into um, Tim's uh, presentation of um, when someone does not understand someone else's communication style, it's easily to dismiss and overruled um, based on um, their belief of what um, my brother could uh, be functioning in trying to, to communicate. And then when family tried to advocate and step in, we were also dismissed because we did not have the letters of conservatorship. Um, even though um, our gut feeling when we were asked to um, sign over our temporary letters to the uh, professional conservator at the time, it did state that uh, the conservator should consult and support uh, the family in all medical decisions and hiring and the caregiving because we had over 30, at the time, 33 years experience of supporting Martin and making sure that all his needs were met and that um, we were providing um, training to the caregivers and his healthcare team to understand all the little nuances of his communication style, but they were all dismissed. And um, and I'm so sorry, you have a, a minute or so if, if you're able to wrap it up. I know yep. this is really important information. Yeah, no worries. Thank and you. so um, with that, uh, we continue on um, fighting to the present here. Um, and then I'll just skip ahead to the Few other slides. So these are the areas of supports that we had to um, continue building um, the team for Martin and um, accessing and coordinating services. Um, so anywhere from caregivers to the medical, dental, and specialist to the education, independent, and living supports and therapy for Martin, uh, excuse me, for my family and for my younger brother, and um, the financial and legal supports that's needed there. And um, with my work um, and continuing um, be parting of the community services, this is um, from where um, the Kelsey has created this in talking about uh, segregation versus integrated versus inclusive. And this is where supported decision-making and self-determination is in part of the bucket of inclusive and inclusivity. And um, we are uh, challenging the systems in the sense that some systems are still segregated, meaning in group homes and um, different areas of institutions and uh, facilities or development centers um, versus integrated where there's some, but there's not fully uh, being 
honored of the voice and the self-determination. And this is where we're pushing for is inclusive. I'm just summarizing here is all the housing and community and um, triangle of community living that we all need the circles of supports and honor the supported decision-making and um, self-determination to support um, people with uh, disabilities to access in um, self-determination and supported in every aspect of their life. And with that, I just wanna wrap up and say thank you. And it's been an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this panel today. Thank you so much, Anne, for sharing that information. And I know it's invaluable for everyone here. Um, I am here with my daughter, Kylie, as well. This is Kylie Francisco. Um, I am actually a mother of three young adults who are um, exceptionally uh, different, have exceptionally different abilities and they have uh, congenital muscular dystrophy and autism. And my daughter is um, cunning and, uh, and full of um, young lady energy. And, and um, she's here <laughs> to share uh, about her supporters and how we support her in her life. And so um, Kylie uses an AAC device, right? You've got your communication device. This is, this is Yes, these, these, there's a lot of people in here that we don't know yet, right? Um, um, so we oh. did a video um, oh. because Kylie can sometimes oh. experience anxiety. So you'll hear in a couple of times in here saying uh oh and ABC. And she's sharing about the supporters in her life and how they support her. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the video now. One second. Oh. Suzanne, if you experience any trouble, I have it actually set up and ready to go so I can do it on my end as well. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Here we go. Hi, Kylie. This is Kylie Francisco, and she's going to talk about... I just want to ask if people can hear. The audio is coming clearer through on my end. Okay, great. Um, the closed captions. There we go. I'm going to start it over one more time. Hey, Kylie. This is Kylie Francisco, and she's going to talk about her support That's with her supporter, Pamela. Good day, good Hello. I take my device everywhere I go. I take my device everywhere I go. I am good at programming my device Bye. and showing my supporters how... Bye-bye. I am good at programming my device and showing my Amy. supporters how to edit. Amy. I can tell you what I think, comment, or tell you how I feel, then press. Chat. Kylie, can you tell us a little bit about you? About me. I am not shy about telling people what I want. I am persistent and find a way even if someone tries to take my device. About me, mm -hmm. I am not shy about telling people what I want. Oh. I am pers oh. What's your name? My uh -oh. name is Kali. I am 21 years old. I want uh -oh. my mom and dad to help me at school, at home, in the community, with my medical and money. Oh, what about your supporters? I like my supporters. They are like family. Oh. Oh, wow. Can you tell me some of your supporters' names? <laughs> Miss Pamela. Please. Jeff. Can you give me another name? Who's that? Miss Samara. <laughs> Good job. Oh. Can you tell me about your choices? <laughs> tell me about your choices. Bye bye. I used to ride the bus before coronavirus. Uh oh. Now because of coronavirus. That's... Now because of coronavirus, we meet in a Zoom meeting on my Chromebook. Uh -oh. I work with my teacher, aid, speech, OT, behaviorist, job person, and yoga. I will. Bye bye. 
And with yoga. 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 Director Carissa gave us our new service dog. Uh oh. Yay, blue. Next. Tell me about the people That's at school. The people at school help me communicate, make friends, take care of myself, bye bye. learn a job, shop, use bye the bus, bye. and hang out with my friends at bye school. Bye. And Go ahead. What about the coronavirus? Now, because of coronavirus, we meet in a Zoom meeting on my Chromebook. What about this one? And with your director. Who do you work with? I work with my teacher, aid, speech, <laughs> OT, behaviorist, job person, and yoga. Uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Can you tell me something about your dog? Uh oh. Yeah. Director Carissa gave us our new service dog. Director Carissa gave us our new service dog. Hi. Next. Tell me about the people at school. The people at school help me communicate, make friends, take care of myself, learn a job, shop, use the bus, and hang out with my friends at school and in the community. Bye-bye. 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 What do you Stop. enjoy doing? You like to do a lot. I enjoy my support team like Victoria Behavior Therapist who help me at home and in the community. And Miss Victoria. Okay. And Miss Victoria. Yeah, the behavior that's that's therapist. That's that's can you tell us about your programs that you do socially? You want Victoria to come over. Yeah. Oh. Okay. And Miss Victoria, the behavior therapist, I have attended several social programs like Prop and the F. F. And Miss Victoria. The behavior okay, therapist, okay. I have attended several social programs like Prognia and B. F. F. Oh. On Zoom and outdoors to connect with friends. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. What about your case manager? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Jessica, my case manager from Regional Center, helps me. Mom and Dad find services. She writes them on my eye. P. P. Jessica, my case manager from Regional Center, helps me. Mom and Dad find services. Mama. Okay, what about this? My person centered plan has pictures for me. My person centered plan has pictures for me. What others like and admire about me. Being a good sister, having a big That's smile, choosing a great music, baby. being independent, sweet baby. and loving, giving great hugs and kisses. Oh, My person centered plan has pictures for me. What others like and admire. <laughs> what do other people like about you? Kylie what also likes to like admire yeah. about me. Being a good sister, having a big smile. Choosing a great music, like being independent, oh. sweet and loving, giving great hugs and kisses. Absolutely. A, B, A, B, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, L, P. What about your support? What others like and admire about you, being a good sister, having a big smile, choosing a great music, being independent, sweet and loving, giving great hugs and kisses. Can you tell me about Mommy. what supports you? How to be a line that works for me. Please don't make assumptions about me. Uh oh. I understand everything that is said. I am able to make my own choices with supporters. What do you like to listen to? How to support me in a way that works for me. Please don't make assumptions. What do you like to listen to? I like to listen to all kinds of music. My favorite color is purple. I like to listen to all. What about this? Sometimes it is difficult for me to be in crowds and loud places. I love to go out in the public, but movie theaters and closed spaces I do not prefer. I love to hang out at the mall. Sometimes it is difficult for me to be in crowds and loud places. 
Uh-oh. I'd love to go out. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh -oh. Tell me about your parents. What about mom and dad? My parents help me with my medical, sometimes called health care. Mm -hmm. oh. What about your medical health care? Uh-oh. My parents help me with my medical, sometimes called health care. My medical needs mean going to the doctor, taking medicine, or sometimes going to the hospital. I mean what you like. I like my doctor, Dr. Traeger. Bye-bye. I have more doctors for my stomach and bathroom needs. Bye-bye. Dr. Avon helps give medicine, makes me feel calm. Dr. Strober talks to me about my head and my body. Tell me more about your parents. Oh. My parents help pay for things I want to need like my house, food, clothes, and fun. Oh. Tell me more about what you like. I like board games with friends, music, and movies. Uh -oh. What do you like to do in the community? Uh oh. I love to be out in the community. What's your favorite thing to do on your device? Uh -oh. I am quick in finding what I need on YouTube by sight reading. Uh oh. Uh -oh. And I don't want help with this. Bye bye. I get social security money. I want my parents to help me with money in the bank. In the bank account. To help me keep money. Where do you keep your money? Mommy. In the bank account. To help me keep money in the bank account. Mommy. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening and hearing me. Kylie, thank you for sharing with everybody about how you talk with your device and you have supporters. What are we going to say? Thank you for listening and hearing me. Thank you for listening and hearing me. Thank you, Kylie. So, thank you for... for um really listening and hearing I say that again because so many times my daughter doesn't have the opportunity to express herself and she was so excited to do this and she told everyone over and over again how she um, programs her own device and tells people how to edit because they can't figure it out so um, this is her first time presenting and um, I just want to uh, share that um, people with AAC um, needs don't often get heard and it really requires that we have patience and listen so that we can hear um, what their abilities are and that um, I, I have three young adults and none of them are conserved and so we've gone to the hospital we um, serve them through the regional center through the schools and we have goals in the IEP and in the IPP um, directly tied to supported decision making. So I haven't had an issue, to be honest with you, with any of my adult children in that. Um, and it's just a matter of writing it in the goals and filling out the forms that you need to have. So I really want to thank you. And thank you, Kylie, for sharing. Bye. She's got her communications shirt on, by the way. <laughs> Kylie, that was great. Well done. So I think we're going to move on to Q&A. Yes, um, we will. OK, great. Thank you. The, all the presentations were so good. Um, we have a few questions that have come in. And I think the first one, Dr. Kripke, if you could answer this, because I saw you posted a answer in the chat, but I think it's an important one that everybody's thinking about. And I don't know if everybody saw the chat. And that was about the financial and legal aspects of conservatorship as a protection against fraud and getting into binding contracts for persons with disabilities. Um, and they were talking, someone else was talking about financial documents and accounts. Can you share what you wrote in the, in the chat, Dr. Kripke? Sure, I, um, I'm a doctor, I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, so this is my, my parent hat, not my, um, not my professional hat speaking, but there's lots of ways to 
protect people financially um, that don't involve conservatorship. Um, some of them include setting up joint accounts, um, setting up a Cal Able account, which is an account uh, set up for people with disabilities. Um, and the Cal Able accounts allow people to, uh, to put, put their own money. They can put their SSI check in there. They can put their, um, any money that they earn or, or other people can contribute to it. And it's, it, the money is controlled by the person. They can have an authorized representative um, who can uh, help them manage that account and you can get a prepaid cash card. So you could have you know, a large amount of money in there and your authorized representative or you could put a small amount of money on a prepaid cash card that you could use for allowance money for um, or for or, or for specific purchases. You can also set up accounts where you get email or text alerts when certain transaction happens or when balances are low um, uh, so that you can know what's going on immediately as it's happening. Um, you can freeze credit accounts so it's very difficult to sign. I think you need to release your credit to sign sell contracts and open bank accounts and to do a lot of the things that fraudsters might do. You would need, uh, if you freeze their credit, they won't be able to do it. Um, there, there's all sorts of ways short of conservatorship that allow you flexibility in the future to change those arrangements. Um, people also need financial educations. Um, uh, it's not just people with disabilities who make stupid decisions when they're young and inexperienced um, uh, with, with their money. Young, young adults open credit card accounts that they can't pay off and get into sell contracts without understanding them too. Everybody needs a financial education and also people need some experience with money and with fraud with money. So, you know, that experience that we protect kids with disabilities from of getting your lunch money stolen or having a friend not pay back a small loan you made them and all that stuff is extremely important for people to be able to say, yeah, I see how I could be manipulated and I want to, I, I want to voluntarily agree to set up some protections and to allow my supporters to help me with this. Um, SSI accounts can have rep payees um, who, who can help, who are fiduciary responsibilities, which means that you're not making the decisions, you're helping the person make the decisions, but there is some, uh, some check and balance. So, th so there, there's, there's lots of creative ways, depending on your situation, to help protect people financially and conservatorship really ties your hands. It's not you who's controlling the money. It's a judge who's controlling, who controls the money and you won't be able to serve as conservator forever. The judge may not select you. Uh, you may lose your capacity to manage money and the judge may not release you from your responsibilities. All things, sorts of things can go wrong with conservatorships and you don't have control for fixing them when they do. And that actually brings us to the next question, which perfect lead in. Um, and I don't know if Jonathan wants to get in and answer this or Suzanne, I think you can answer this as well or Judge Doherty. Um, but someone wrote to us and said that they were in co-conservatorship -co -co and um, there was a, an issue came up with that. And in the talking with the judge, there was no way they, he, the judge said, there's no way they're gonna co-conserve. So they brought in a family friend at their next hearing to potentially join the conservatorship and the judge ordered that they would, that they, the judge would be conservators pending investigation. So the question is, is there any chance he, the judge would let us stay in the conservatorship with friends having deciding vote? What are the chances he'd appoint a conservator? Any chance for a man uh, down the line for, of emancipated, emancipation? I think um, Jonathan can chime in as well, but this is not an uncommon situation. Um, I myself am divorced and, and it was a very difficult time to keep my children not conserved, but often the court doesn't really want to um, argue between parents. And so they might assign somebody that they find is unbiased. And also, even if you have a, a line of family members who are uh, uh, designated to be co-conservators, even highly skilled special education teachers and things like that, they can assign 
a conservator. That's why it's called a court appointed conservator. So I think there's an illusion of protection and an illusion of control that parents think they have because that's the information that they're given about conservatorship. Um, Jonathan, you wanna say something else about this? Or Judge Doherty? Basically, the friends are not going to be able to choose. It's the bottom line. The, the court does. Yeah. Hi. Um, one, I, I, this is Jonathan, and, and thank you so much for this conference. It's been incredible just hearing everyone's experiences. And it is amazingly heartening to hear so many strong advocates who I've known for years just leading the way. Um, it, it, it amazes me that, that really supported decision-making only entered the national conversation about seven years ago. And in just that time, we have 11 states with laws and God willing more coming on. In the answer specifically to the question, it's, it's impossible to say exactly what will happen. Anything could happen. That's one of the dangers I think of conservatorship is ultimately you're inviting the court into your life for the rest of your life. I tell parents all the time that you're not ultimately going to be the conservator, the judge will, and the judge will decide who gets to make decisions and how those decisions will be made. So could there be a way the judge will, will do what you want? Sure. Um, my recommendation would be to discuss that if you can come to an agreement with the other party, maybe recommend a third party to be that, that last co-conservator. Uh, I am currently involved in a case in New York where family members could not get along. So the judge appointed a guardian that no one is happy with. So again, that's one of the dangers of conservatorship. But one of the benefits of what you're talking about is the possibility for cooperation. And if you can cooperate on a co-conservator, maybe you can cooperate on an emancipation plan, that these are the specific steps that we're going to take to help this person become more involved in decision-making and become more independent. And I realize I did not answer your question. And that's because questions like these are unanswerable. It's possible that what you want could happen. It is possible that it won't. It's in the judge's hands. That's one of the dangers of conservatorship. Thank you, Jonathan. That was perfect. Can I just add, Susan or yeah. Darlene? Or? Oh, yeah, perfect. Um, I, I think this emphasizes a really significant point, which is you really have to train the judiciary in every state whether or not supported decision making is incorporated into statutes or not. You need to train judges so that when there is reference to these alternative dispositions, which they kind of recognize in their statutes, they have to consider. Supported decision making is one of those alternatives and not just some wacky idea that comes up at a court hearing. The second thing is um, prosecutors and law enforcement must be trained on uh, manipulation of vulnerable persons. It seems that uh, if a uh, uh, a non uh, divergent person is taken advantage of in criminal law, um, that is treated as a crime. If there is a person with uh, an impairment, a disability, a learning disorder, uh, simply aged, th those cases are not exactly treated the same way because they attribute part of the crime to the person who was victimized by their absence of skills. It's implicit, it's not, it's not um, a conscious behavior, but we really need to train other segments of our community that touch our families and touch our protected persons in a way to make sure they're equally treated and the same in court. In our court, when I was the judge, we had mandatory mediation when family disputes arose and the case would go to mediation, the protected person or proposed protected person would be involved and typically those cases were resolved in a satisfactory manner. Um, not all, but it certainly reduced litigation and contention. And in those jurisdictions that automatically appoint a private person, um, a private agency or a private guardian, we wanna to talk to those judges more about family involvement and family representation in those cases because nine out of 10 times they're the better person. And how many stories do we know have been confirmed of abuse 
at the hands of a, a private uh, conservator or guardian. Perfect. And that leads to another good question, a set of questions that we've had coming in. The theme is, and anybody can jump in, but how do you decide before, between supportive decision making and conservatorship? Well, you know, some people say, well, it might sound like a good idea, but it might not work for my child. So how, how do you make that decision? And this is for any of the speakers. Well, I couldn't really say for anybody um, what they would do for their child because I don't know their child, but I know my child and I know what um, the decision that I have made. And I mean, really, if we had a show of hands, who here doesn't want their child to be safe, happy, and as independent as possible? I mean, probably everyone here would raise their hand. And, and I think that if there isn't, if there is a way that that we can practice teaching them skills and self-determination skills that shows that keeps them safer. Uh, people who, who learn and practice skills early on, like Judge Doherty and others were talking about, um, are able to avoid conservatorship. How can you avoid conservatorship if you never learn those skills? And so if, if we're able to teach them skills and not hand that over to the court, then I guess my question as a parent is, why would you do that if you don't have to? And I think it's really a matter of people just don't know that they don't have to, they think they have to. Very good. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question. We have a couple more minutes left here. And um, it's about, there's a theme coming in about regional center and um, do regional centers often question or fight against um, power of attorney documentations when the client is not abused, is, I guess what was written, but it doesn't, I don't know if it's abused, um, conserved maybe, um, I think it probably is conserved, but um, so just how is this working out for regional center? We had one family write in and they said that they were the conservator, but the regional center does not share how to set up access to information and is not forthcoming because they're conservator. Uh, they're, they're, they're just having a partnership problem with the regional center, I guess. Um, I can say that um, every regional center is different, very different. Some, I can't wait to train four counties on supported decision-making and others, um, it, it can be more difficult. Um, in terms of, I'm trying to keep track of the questions, in terms of being able to help somebody who's a conservator, help somebody with regional center services, um, I have goals for my children that says person-centered planning and supported decision-making and that they choose me as a supporter. And that has been the end of it for my regional center. But in the case of abuse, this is what I would say is conservatorship has an illusion of protection, right? Because it doesn't protect people from abuse. It doesn't protect people from isolation. It doesn't protect people from law enforcement. And in fact, it seems that a lot of the stories of people in isolation, a lot of those people who are abused in isolation are actually conserved. Um, and so I, I can't tell you what each regional center has done, but we know that people who are conserved um, are not protected from those things. So um, can anybody guarantee that that conservatorship or power of attorney or any anything would keep somebody from being abused? And no. So really, um, we looked to the studies that show that self-determination um, really were able to let people women with intellectual disability be better able to recognize and resist abuse. That's study after study on self-determination. So that we know, and we know that the National Guardianship Association um, recommends that you always try supported decision-making wherever possible before uh, conserving or, or putting somebody within a guardianship. So you wanna say something close? Um, yeah, I do. Um, I think there's a lot of myths about regional centers and regional center, um, a, a, if you actually read the Lanterman Act, it, number one, regional centers cannot make decisions on behalf of clients, um, except in the case of, of medical care, they're authorized to, they're not required to, but only if there aren't parents, authorized representatives, supported, uh, supported decision makers or other people designated. So there's sort of a, a last resort for, for medical uh, decisions. And I don't think you, uh, in my personal experience, who's 
made hundreds of decisions using regional center uh, uh, personnel for support um, uh, is, is that they, believe it or not, regional centers are not dying to get involved in your stuff if they don't have to. They're busy. Um, it takes time and energy. They're, they're, they're not in the business of trying to control your life or your kid's life if there's some other easier solution for them, like having a parent do it. And there's strong language in the, in the Lanterman Act saying that regional centers are need to respect the role of parents and family members in people's lives. And if there's any other arrangement, a supported decision making, a power of attorney, an authorized representative, a personal preference, um, that takes precedence over anything the regional center uh, can do. And that's written into the law. So if your regional center is not respecting that, um, then point them to the law, get Disability Rights California involved, um, uh, get other advocates involved because that's just false. Um, and um, and uh, I, I think there's this myth that regional centers are, you know, interested in getting involved in, in people's lives when they don't have to. And, um, and that just isn't my experience and it's not what the law says. Thank you. The other thing is, I'm sorry, a, a person, a consumer can invite anyone they want to an IPP meeting. So particularly if they want their parents or they don't want their parents, whether they're conserved or whether they're not conserved, if they want somebody besides their conservator to go to the IPP meeting, at any time they can invite anyone they want. It's in the welfare and institution code. So. Well, I want to say thank you to everyone. It's noon, our time here in California. And um, this has been amazing rich conversation. It's so awesome. Um, so I want to say thank you. And I, there are a few questions probably out there that we didn't have time to get to. And I apologize for that. Please email us at um, the website and um, we'll get back to you on that if we can, or tell you where you can go to get back, uh, get that information. The other thing is uh, Suzanne and I are going to be presenting with some other panelists uh, at Caltash on March 6th. Uh, so we have a session there on supported decision making. So that might be another opportunity uh, to get more information. I really encourage people to get more and more information as much as they can. And of course, Disability Voices United, we will continue to uh, work on this. We're developing an interchange, which will have a lot of information on it. Um, it should be launched um, early March. And supported decision making interchange, yes, specifically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we have other interchanges that are already launched, but the supported decision making when it change should be launched early March. So um, I want to say thank you to everyone, the speakers and the participants and the audience is great. Thank you so much for all your participation, participation, both as presenters and, and uh, joining us and learning more and please tell everyone you know. And so that more people will know, share with your schools, share with your regional centers, um, service providers, because people really want to know that there are other options they just don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much.